All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our Career Pathway user group. For our agenda today, we're going to really talk about um, a, just one main topic is really our course sequence. Uh, we'll start with the uh, purpose and go through some quick announcements with you and then um, get right into it. So my name is Bill Rose. I'm with the NIU Illinois CTE project. We work in collaboration with ISBE. Uh, with me, we have Heather Lucan. Heather, if you want to uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Morning, everyone. Heather Lucan, PC for, um, well, CTE department uh, at ISBE. And uh, good to see everyone this morning. And then Jason's helping us with some support. Um, he's, he's on the road again. And um, so he'll be helping us along the way. Um, and then we have members from our team as well that are um, going to be assisting with the um, uh, uh, presentation. So the purpose of the Career Pathway User Group is really um, just to share information. And you'll notice um, in the past few weeks, we've had a few people share out um, a few emails using the Career Pathway User Group um, email. And so we just want to continue to encourage that collaboration by using the user group and using that email, feel free to share out and, um, you know, put things out there for the field. Um, I, I think we saw a few surveys that went out. We saw um, uh, an email on uh, a, a district looking for someone uh, for a position that was kind of neat. And so uh, please continue to use that as we're going through and, um, and collaborating in, in this group. Um, we just really want to emphasize that uh, with this work is that the vision of the career and college pathway endorsement is really based on that quality and relevance and authenticity component. And so um, as we continue to do this work in our school districts, but also as a collaborative effort um, that we really are focusing in on that work around quality and relevance and authenticity and um, trying to put something out there for our students that uh, resonates with them when they are looking into careers and, and really looking into the future that they have. And so um, keeping that in mind as we continue to do this work and focusing in on things like the essential skills is key to this work. And so we really want to just kind of hammer away at that message as we continue to uh, offer these presentations and collaboration. And so as we're doing that, as a part of this work, um, Heather had a few quick announcements. Yeah, I just I just have one, <laughs> but it kind of en encapsulates a, a whole bunch of stuff. So there will be uh, an email that is going out probably within an hour or two. Well, no, I don't. I really don't want to commit to that. So there will be an email going out <laughs> today by the end of the day um, for um, that'll that'll be sent to the district contacts for the CCPEs and it will outline the process for um, where we're at with the reviews and information about second reviews and approvals and so forth. So be on the lookout for that, uh, for the district contacts, so you'll have all that. Um, if any of those emails bounce back to me, <laughs> because I have them all in a group right now, then that tells me that that district contact information is incorrect. So I will reach out to the superintendent to find out who the new district contact is to make sure that uh, that all the information gets out there. So um, you can just let the districts know that, that that's going to be occurring today. And hopefully that will, uh, if there's any additional questions, obviously once they receive that, feel free to um, email me and uh, I'll respond to them. You're muted, Bill. Thank you. Um, just a, a few other quick announcements as we have a few um, uh, trainings coming up here for professional development on April 3rd and April 10th. And so if you wanna check out our professional learning calendar, those are accessible on the calendar that are linked right here. Um, we also have our summer calendar as well um, that is open for um, we're going on the road this this summer. And so if you want to check out where we're going to be and and uh, participate in some of those, we're, we're going to be all over the state of Illinois. So um, and also in a, in a real quick announcement is the registration for the ISB Career Connections Conference, uh, which is June 18th 
and it will be hosted at Tinley Park Convention Center. And so uh, we highly recommend that if you have not signed up or you're still looking for a PD for um, teachers or educators in your district uh, to check out the ISBE conference website. They have a whole web page that they've been updating. And so uh, just really want to get that message out to uh, school districts, especially with uh, so much of the work in our uh, career pathways um, that are aligned with uh, the CTE work that's going on in the state. So um, check it out, check out the registration. It's all here in the slide deck. And so now we're going to just kind of uh, move into the endorsement course sequence conversation and really trying to connect it to the post-secondary um, component and just want to kind, kind of briefly get into the, the history and then move into that conversation. And so we know that uh, back in May 27th, 2022, that this um, legislation, HB 3296, was signed into law. Um, we know that with that change in the law that um, essentially it, it set up this pathway uh, for, for moving along the career pathway endorsement. And so uh, we know in 2027 that schools are being asked to uh, provide one career pathway endorsement for their students. By 2029, it's two, and 2031, it's three. And so as, as that work is continuing in our school districts, that conversation is happening around, you know, what does that process look like? Uh, what what do we have to do as a school district to to meet the minimum guidelines to to 2027? And so um, that's a lot of the work that Heather has been doing at the state and going through endorsements and uh, re really um, doing the work at the state level for us. But um, we just kind of want to. Uh, reiterate that this work is ongoing, that it, it continues to add with additional endorsements as we go through the years, and that as you're going through this process, that school districts set forth a, a process that works uh, for them and, and, and for their um, uh, students and, and families. And so um, here we have that kind of outlined component as a part of the career uh, college and career pathway endorsement. You see the career focus instructional sequence. And, and that mandate says that two years of secondary coursework are a part of this work. And so um, th that's one of the key components is oftentimes um, it comes up as, you know, what, what classes do I need or what are the um, minimal requirements? It's really kind of laid out in this slide that the two years of secondary coursework um, must must be um, a part of this work. And it also must include at least six hours of early college credit. So why now this conversation? Why did we kind of uh, move forward with this idea for the uh, March uh, Career Pathway User Group? Well, we know that developing and implementing a course sequence is really a complex um, issue because there's so many things that have to kind of come in alignment with that. And so that dual credit conversation comes up that we had last month where Dr. Lopez uh, really outlined some of the, the challenges and some of the things that are happening throughout the state with uh, dual credit. Um, and so that time in, in working with your post-secondary institutions can, be, uh, can take up a lot of time. Um, we know that with board approvals that have to happen every year. And, and usually they're happening in September or at maybe the latest October is that you have to have those kind of course sequences in stone um, to really get it in front of your board. And so we wanted that conversation to start as soon as possible if it hasn't already started for uh, districts around the idea that um, you know August, September, October of this year um, we really have to kind of have those kind of things in stone um, to, to get those approvals for um, the 2025 and 2026 school year. And so we wanted those conversations to take place for you to be able to um, have that opportunity to, to really get ahead of this work. And so, um, and oftentimes some of this work happens over the summer as well. I think most of you know that um, the, those conversations are taking place over the summer as well. And then finally, that ability to be 
proactive with uh, students and families is that, you know, if, if you are making changes to your course sequence or you're making any kind of even little changes that um, you're able to communicate it with your community members on why those changes occurred or how's it going to impact your students that are in a current pathway or how, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions that come up of um, how it may impact students in the future. And so being able to proactively communicate that we felt is, is key to this conversation. And so we're kind of in this um, uh, moment now where since 2022 and the legislation uh, passed, we were kind of like eating cereal at night, right? And so uh, we're, we're, it's fast, it's, it's efficient, it's um, something that we, you're, are, we're getting our uh, dinner delivered to us, but we kind of want to take this approach that as, as time moves forward and we're getting better uh, used to this process is that it becomes more of a slow cooker and that, um, that dinner actually is probably a lot better made in a slow cooker and taking our time and making sure that um, we're, we're doing some of those things that were mentioned in the previous slide of communicating proactively with parents, um, setting out a process um, that, that works better for school districts and ensuring that, um, you know, this work is, is kind of well thought out with, with the different stakeholders like our um, uh, colleges as a part of the dual credit conversation. And if I if I can just interject, if you like the cereal for dinner analogy to school change and school improvement versus the slow cooker or fancy dinner analogy that we would all like to be having, when you take the evaluation today, in all seriousness, please tell us that you like that analogy um, because we're we're trying that on for size, uh, really. Uh, to and it applies, as uh, unfortunately all of our school administrators know, to other things, uh, right, beyond just the endorsements. And so uh, it's all too often how, how we do school change and school improvement. So uh, let us know. Thanks so much, Bill. And it was it was a great idea. I think we kind of talked about it a few, a few days ago. Um, so Jason, credit to him for um, a, an awesome idea. When we get into this conversation, really um, taking a, a just kind of um, 30,000 foot approach to this, right, is that that career focus instructional sequence, um, there's a there's kind of a lot of moving parts in it, right? And so um, you have that um, ninth grade, maybe orientation uh, type of course or 10th grade as a part of that. You have your skill development courses, and then you have your capstone courses at the end, usually in uh, 12th grade. And, and so very similar to how we're kind of planning our coursework um, as teachers of thinking, what do my kids have to learn? Um, oftentimes we, we highly recommend thinking about where do we start? We start at the end, we, we backwards plan. And so um, just kind of keeping that as a part of that conversation is, is if we have to start at the end, that that end conversation oftentimes starts with the dual credit conversation that was had um, last month and, and really communicating with your colleges uh, and universities and really figuring out what is that dual credit component as a part of this work. And so as we get into that instructional sequence, again, kind of reiterating this idea is that there is at least two years of coursework or equivalent competencies is part one of this. Um, part two is that um, ideas that we are consulting with our, our partners, both in the post-secondary world, but also our EFEs are, are a major part of this work. They, they play a process in this design as laid out by um, the, the state. Um, and then part three really goes into this, that students must earn at least the six hours of credit, which is oftentimes through, um, through two, two courses with uh, three credits. Um, in some cases, it's not always that simple, but um, it's oftentimes the two courses with three credits. And so as we continue this conversation, uh, making sure that those minimums are met, right, is that the two years, the four semesters of coursework are met, um, that the earning of at least six early college credit hours are part of this work, and taking into consideration some some key questions. 
do the courses in the course sequence, teach the students the skills and or the content that are career pathway specific. Um, that's a really key uh, component of this work is, um, and you're gonna see a few examples coming up here that we're gonna dive into uh, as a part of that question, but also do the courses in the course sequence help students learn the actual work that are, are part of this. Um, and so, you know, really kind of thinking about that idea of like, how does it match the work in these careers um, and being intentional around that, that question around the work. So we're going to get into our conversations component as we um, move through the uh, presentation. Just real quickly, we, we highly recommend that people, you know, do reach out to their EFEs um, as a part of this process. Um, you know, it, it's very much laid out in, in the process that an eligible school district should consult with a regional education for employment director. Um, and so um, they play a, a key role in all of this and understanding that um, they are oftentimes working with po the post-secondary institutions. They have a really good uh, mindset on the state SIPs. Um, they they have uh, a host of information on the career aspect of, you know, why you would create an endorsement around the um, economic um, components of it, right? Is you have to show that, you know, economically that those careers are available to students in that region. And so um, they have all of that information as a part of this conversation. And so reaching out to them and engaging them are a part of this process. And so continuing those conversations with them are key um, as we move through this process. And you'll notice that we have the regional delivery system um, uh, uh, directory here. And so um, there's a link to that as well if you, if you need that. Um, understanding the fact that as you are developing those conversations with your EFE and post-secondary that they have to be articulated to a certain degree or certificate. And so whether that's a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, apprenticeship, a college certificate, or an industry credential, um, it has to articulate to one of those. And so keeping that component is in, in mind. And so we wanted to give a few examples of that. Um, if, if you're looking at it from a bachelor's degree, School A offers a dual credit, course aligned to a teacher education program at a university, very simply um, aligns to a bachelor's degree at the university, um, all the way to the um, associate's degree example, an apprenticeship, college certificate, and industry credential. Each one of these examples offers up um, just one simple example as to how you can align this to a certificate or a degree. Um, I would just make a special call out to the associate's degree one. You'll notice um, it says School B offers courses with dual art and articulated credit that align with a local community college law enforcement program with dual credit sociology. We're going to have a few examples that talk about this, but, you know, that sociology course should have uh, work related activities and be specifically geared in that case to the law enforcement uh, career field. And, and, and so that will come up in a few other examples as you as you see that. Um, example kind of pop up. And, and consulting your post-secondary partners, you know, this again goes back to that conversation last month that Dr. Lopez had presented on is thinking about ideas around staffing, you know, what, um, what kind of agreements have you come to with your post-secondary institutions around staffing, those kind of courses and dual credit. Um, thinking, taking into consideration the transfer credit piece that he, he touched quite a bit on, on that kind of 1.1 versus 1.2 uh, question and, and ensuring that uh, those conversations are had because the 1.1 and 1.2 do have differences as a part of uh, transfer to other universities. And then overall, the, the agreement that um, high schools are making with the post-secondary world is what what is a part of that agreement um, what are the details and that and how are you working to um, make that agreement uh, advantageous for your students and so keeping those um, questions in, uh, in line as a part of this work I think are important 
And so again, kind of talking about, you know, what kind of uh, early cre college credit are we offering as well? It becomes a question, is it dual credit? Is it advanced placement credit? Is it international baccalaureate? Is it articulated? Those are conversations that are should be uh, ha happening as soon as possible in making those changes to the course sequence. Because um, obviously if you need the six credits, then um, you have to have those laid out what, in one of those kind of formats. And so um, having those conversations now as, as time is, ha is happening and you're making changes for the 2025, 2026 school years, do we have our dual credit lined up? If not, you know, what are we looking at for other options maybe, or do we, are we gonna offer an advanced placement course? Is it gonna be articulated credit and so on? And we just kind of threw these in here as the examples from last month and uh, really looking at this registered nurse program. Obviously, you know, this could be um, in some cases, I believe it would be at a bachelor's degree in others, it could be an associate degree uh, for registered nurse, but essentially, you know, looking at the end of what this uh, backwards design process might look like. And so you, you can see in red, the um, different requirements of the coursework that students would, would need to um, address that um, kind of uh, certificate or degree program. And then another example here uh, that was brought up last time uh, around accountancy. And so this one is more aligned to a um, uh, community college uh, associate's degree um, and, and really um, thinking about the management of the 1.1 versus the 1.2. Uh, you can see here the 1.2 that's listed that was brought up last uh, meeting. And so again, this this is a, a kind of rehashing that 1.1, 1.2 um, example. Uh, the 1.1 courses are designed to transfer with the Illinois Articulation Initiative. Um, and then the 1.2 courses just are, are laid out here, but are not designed to transfer. And so keeping that mindset of there's, there's two separate um, routes here and, and ensuring that you're looking at how those uh, courses transfer for your students as they are getting into um, these conversations with colleges. And, and again, just having an awareness of how this may impact our students. So we wanna get into a few examples here and uh, we hope that it will really uh, drive a conversation that we wanna get to here shortly is that um, here is one of the pathways that may be a high school might um, develop for their human and public services pathway. And so you see at the end, the capstone course teaching methods, uh, which it would be a dual credit course that would be aligned with either a community college or university. Um, you can see that that application type course, there's a, uh, this school district in this example offers a few options. Um, you don't have to offer you know, all of these options. In fact, some some school districts don't have the ability to offer these options. And so, um, but they do have some form of credit or college credit in that application course. Um, you notice the dual credit so, uh, sociology or psychology, either the AP course, or there's a dual credit education and uh, child care careers. Um, and then they they have the orientation course um, uh, as well that, that students can take. Um, a few call outs, and I, I kind of alluded to this in another example, is that those general courses like sociology and psychology should really be aligning with the pathway. And so, um, uh, Heather, I wanted to kind of just let you kind of talk a little bit about that, because I think that's an important call out um, with um, school sure. districts that are are, are having sure. that conversation. Sure. I know in the initial conversation we, we posed in that previous slide, it was do, or I'm sorry, does does the course, you know, uh, meet the, the skills? Does it teach them the skills needed? Um, but when you're um, providing evidence for your courses, you're doing a, a basic description of the course. And, and that question of does it 
turns into how. How does it do that? So oftentimes some of the feedback that I give um, when I'm doing the reviews is it's a confirmation statement. Yes, yes, this, this class does this. But how does it do that? So when we talk about psychology um, being used within that education pathway, there needs to be an assurance. So that's the conversation then you're having with that instructor that there are components there are um, multiple ways to embed that psychology with an educational focus. So um, that is crucial to this. When you're thinking about that, um, oftentimes before we would have things like a, an, an English 101, Comp 101 type. Well, that's needed. Yes, that could be needed across all of our career pathways. But how is that truly teaching the skills necessary for that specific career? And how is it showing them um, what the, the work will be like within that specific career? So that those need to be answered um, within the description, um, in addition to the description, actually, of that class. And, and so, Heather, if, if people came back and said, well, we, we can't do that in an AP course because that doesn't align with the college board, what would be your response to that? That's a good one, Jason. Thanks for that. <laughs> I know what my what I think your response would be. So let me let me jump in and then publicly cor correct me if I'm wrong here. But I think okay. I think your re I think your response would be so certainly your school district can choose to teach that like ISBE doesn't dictate that, but that would not then be an appropriate course for the course right. sequence for the right. career pathway. Ultimately, yeah. and and so again, there's I I want to recognize from both the ISBE side and the NIU side. There, and this goes back to last month's meeting also, there's definitely a strong understanding here that like in, in most, uh, to some degree, all school districts, like identifying early college credit courses is, is difficult in the first place. Having teachers who can teach the early college credit courses mm -hmm. makes it even more difficult. And then, yep, there's definitely a third layer here if you want it to be part of a course sequence. And so there's no mistaking that. And so again, part of the solution there may be, well, maybe this just isn't a pathway endorsement for us. This is as close right. as, as we can get to it in this area. What areas can we? And so, um, so it, you know, I, I wanna be sure that everybody statewide understands that um, I think there is wide recognition Certainly, I can speak for our team on on the part of the NIU team, and I believe that's also true for the ISB team. That um, that this isn't easy, and making this work is is complex, and um, and that's where Rodrigo's presentation last month um, was meant to provide some additional uh, information. So, if we can, you know, consider 1.1 versus 1.2 courses. That's mm -hmm. awesome. That may not be an option either, though. Uh, again, depending on on your local circumstances, and so um, part of the reason, to Bill's point, that we're spending the time on this now, because as it is, we're literally setting the dinner table right now uh, for twenty five, twenty six, at the earliest. And I know no one's got time to set the dinner table because you're worried about the applications with Heather for two months from now, um, and that's why we think part of our job is to help kind of lay out, okay, here's where everybody should be thinking ahead, and we're going to try and help help do that for everybody. That's one way we think we can provide some support, um, because we know everybody in the field doesn't, you don't have time to think ahead, like, for the most part. Uh, we certainly understand that. Yeah, th thanks, Jason, for that clarification, and also Heather um, for outlining that that um, that great idea on, on, on how this really works together and aligns. So um, we do have another example here, just real real quickly. Um, and, and this, again, is just a, an example of the information technology pathway that you might be laying out, um, you know, figuring that you're starting with that capstone course uh, with a um, Java em emphasis or the dual credit um, wh whichever one you're, you decide to go with, you know, would work. But each of these is clearly a part of the information technology uh, pathway work because they all have uh, a career alignment to them. Um, so this one maybe looks a little bit easier than, than say, your uh, human and public uh, uh, services pathway one that, that kind of has some questions about, you know, does that psychology or does that sociology course work out? But 
Um, I, I think that there's um, some other examples that we could provide uh, um, at a later time. So recommendations from this point. Well, we're gonna um, we're gonna rely heavily on Heather on this because she um, she worked with us a few days ago on on creating some of these. And so Heather, um, if you want to talk a little bit about these do's and don'ts as we're going through the course requirements and, and the next two slides. Sure. Uh, when you are doing your plans and submitting um, the information, you want to list. So currently now, if, you, if you've been in the PWR platform, I'll backtrack a little bit here, there was the option to select whether it was required or recommended. Moving forward, we're not going to have that um, within the Iowa system. And so I'm really not paying attention right now, honestly, to how you have that marked, if it's required or recommended. What I would expect to see with that pathway course sequence are only those courses that you want to have approved that meet the criteria. So it's only those that meet the criteria that the students are going to have to take in some combination, potentially, depends on how many you list. Um, to, to meet those requirements. So again, it's the two years, four semesters, and within those, um, the best minimum, within that you have the six early college credits that the students would have to have opportunity to earn. Um, we did have the conversation before regarding those students who are attending a regional program career center um, for an extended day. Perhaps their senior year, they're there for the whole year, and they're there for three hours out of the day. That that criteria of the two years, four semesters could be condensed into just those two semesters because they're extended time. That would have to be outlined as well within the description, just so um, we would know that that's that's the intention for that. So um, that's that's your dues on that. And so opposite, do not just stick all of the requirements not just of the state endorsement, but of graduation requirements. So I've seen that um, a, a few times where it's there's too much, there's too many courses. I, I We just need to have those courses that meet the criteria that you would want the students to take in order to earn that endorsement. Because determining if the student earns the endorsement, that's the next stage of this, and that's on the districts to do that. Um, ISB reviews the plan to ensure that the courses that are offered, the team-based challenges, all those different components are within, uh, they meet the criteria and they're within alignment um, of what we're expecting. So um, that's, that's that on that one. <laughs> oh, okay, yep, we did this one yesterday, I remember. <laughs> so for the education pathway example, you could have all three of these listed. So intro to education, child development, educational psychology. They're all year-long classes. They're all dual credit, and they all receive three hours. So a student could take, this is, you could have this in here. Um, a student would take, they could do intro to education and child development. They meet the criteria for the course sequence of the endorsement. They could do intro to education and educational psychology. That also meets the criteria. Obviously, they have to pass it and all the, those things, but it meets the criteria of what is expected within the course sequence. Or they could take all three. So it, it, again, it's the determination of the district to decide um, and to verify that they've met that. Um, if, if you only have the opportunity for the, I, so I think it's just, I it think that there are a lot of courses that are listed on there um, that are, are not necessary or they're, when you have them back at your district, you really want them to take a, a course prior to this. That's at your discretion. But if it's not going to count in the pathway, the course sequence for here, then, then you would not to put, uh, need to put that in there. I hope that that makes sense. I was trying to explain it to Bill yesterday, and, and, I, and I think that, that, that you just need to show those courses that are going to meet the criteria and allow a student to potentially earn an endorsement from their course sequence. And, and Heather, just to reiterate, I think exactly what you just said at the end there was it just has to meet the requirement, right? It, mm -hmm. we're, we're just looking mm -hmm. to meet the basic state requirement um, to assist you in those um, uh, endorsement applications. And so anything extra is really for you. Like, you know, that's for the school district to figure out and um, not not have to put it in the application if they don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so this um, last slide has a do, do's and don'ts on the course description. Yeah. So did you want to talk some more yeah, about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. This goes back to what I was saying before. Um, when we initially had the, um, the in, in some of the language out there, the discussion was when we're talking about building your course sequence, what types of things do you need to consider? That's where this sentence started with the um, does the course teach the students <laughs> and then we changed that to okay you have to provide evidence because you could just say yep absolutely it does so now we've moved it to the how so when you're doing your course descriptions now um, quite a few I've, I've just recommended you please try to restructure it with basic course description and then you're answering the question how does it teach the students the skills and how does it help them learn um, what the actual work is like in the workplace so focus on the how, not the confirmation that it actually does. I think that's a great, great idea there, um, Heather. And essentially, if, you, if you're able to do that on the application, you're also being able to um, basically uh, figure out the question of how do we communicate this to our, our stakeholders? And that yep. conversation we talked about earlier is, you know, do we, what do we say to parents? What do we say? to um, students and community stakeholders that are all a part of this work. Right, because if you provided the answers to these questions to them, they would have much greater knowledge of what that class actually is. Um, because you can you can tell them, well, th these are the skills they're gonna learn as it relates to that career. And this is what they're gonna learn to, to know um, that, that the work is, is this way in this particular career. Which brings us to our, our kind of, uh, I like I like to think this is fun. I'm I'm excited to do this because we haven't done it in a while. But um, we want to break out into some breakout rooms. And so um, the question here is, what are the best ways in communicating with students, families, and community partners about course sequences? Um, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, get some breakout rooms going. You'll be manual manually assigned, and really talk about that question in that the small groups. We'll bring you back into um, a large group, and then we'll we'll spend a little bit of time um, uh, doing that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and create those rooms. Bill, will the questions in the chat be answered uh, before after? So yeah. Doretta, we'll we'll, we'll I'll work. I'll those. work on that. <laughs> yeah. I'll work on getting those answered. Yep. Yep. So those rooms are open. If you can go ahead and join in into uh, one of those rooms and answer the question, what are the best ways in communicating with students, families, and community partners? We'll bring you back here uh, shortly and, and have a quick discussion on that. Bill, I just moved Joel out of room 14. He was in there by himself. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at him right now too. 
Yeah, Bill, there's a couple settings we need to look at too in your Zoom. There's two things I've noticed today. One is uh, that the co hosts you stuck us all in rooms. So that's not a Zoom settings, that's a when you do it. And the other, though, is I couldn't add Heather as co host. Uh, oh, okay. We can't, we can't pre add her, but I tried adding her once she joined. So those are minor. We'll come back to those. Okay. And we'll uh, help me remember we're at probably about 50 minutes in, we need to edit this part out. Here. Okay. Shavina, did you see a note to go into room 10? I did. Okay. Oh, that was not, I'm going to move you again because Ryan's there. I have, Shavina, I have, a, I have a, a situation right now. Oh, okay. All right. Um, no problem. That's fine. I, I need to talk to you. So when we're done. Yeah, I uh it's gonna have to unfortunately it'll it'll be 1 30. Okay. I'm gonna forward you an email. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We'll give them about two more minutes to to have that discussion. I'll bring them back. So we are starting to see some people come back. Um, we'll give them a, a few seconds as the rooms close out and we'll kind of bring this conversation forward as a, a part of that work. So we'll give them a few seconds to get back in here. All right, so those rooms should be closing out. Um, because we had so many rooms, uh, which is actually a good problem, um, we're gonna actually have um, any individuals who wanna share out something that they heard or a conversation piece that came up, just go ahead and throw it into the chat. 
um, and, and really kind of addressing the question we, we had laid out or what are some of the best ways in communicating with students, families, and community partners. If you have something you want to add to the chat, go ahead and just type it in. We're going to um, compile those messages um, and hopefully have some ideas to share out with um, individuals. But um, please go ahead and just talk about those uh, conversations, throw, throw them into the chat, and then we'll um, go through that data for you as well. So um, as you are uh, talking about those items in the chat and, and really formulating those ideas, we just, again, want to share that um, you might have an idea that comes up with course sequence from this meeting that you're like, oh, we do this really great in our, our school district, or we have this plan that we go through um, that is we, we really feel like is a best practice. We encourage you to email career-pathways-user group. Um, at googlegroups.com, um, you know, send it, send it to the whole group, put a little blurb about it and say, we use this um, resource as a part of the work over at such and such school. Um, you know, and again, kind of through this activity, we hope that that kind of sharing really creates that um, uh, group mentality where we're in this work together, right? Is that we want to provide as many resources and, um, um, best practices as a part of this work. And so um, while you, again, are many of you are typing into the chat, uh, we hope to also share those comments with you um, as, as we share out um, some of this work in that, in that process of using the Career Pathways User Group um, uh, plan. So, so some great comments coming in as we see. We, um, it looks like uh, Dr. Stanton has, we discussed the benefit of using school lengths which I think we could do a whole uh, conversation around that and, and maybe looking at uh, a conversation around um, how school links could play into this process uh, later on. Uh, Katie Turner says, host an eighth grade night for parents to discuss college and career choices in high school. Uh, Katie, that's, a, I think, a great example of how, how you get in front of these types of conversations where as changes are happening, um, and so hosting an eighth grade pathway fair, Shana, a, another great example there as a part of this work. And so we're going to, um, again, if, if you have a great idea that, that you um, came up with or shared as a part of that group, go ahead and share it in this um, chat. So we did want to connect with our next meeting, uh, which will be happening in April. And so um, as we're going through um, some of these conversations, we know that the individual student plan is a big part of this process as well. And it's laid out um, as a part of the career pathway um, endorsement plan. And so um, in, in kind of um, celebration of this work that we've been doing, thinking about, you know, what are our career goals for students? What are we doing around college planning for the individual plan? Uh, what are we doing as a school district to align uh, with financial aid resources for our students? Um, are we doing resume work with them? Um, and, and what does that work look like? Is it, is it different here? And is it a best practice here? Um, are we developing personal statements as a part of that individual plan? That's kind of the conversation that's going to be had next month as we um, gear up for some of these conversations towards the end of the year. And so um, as, you, as you're thinking about those things, um, think about what is our, our district doing today with, with regards to the idea of the individual career and college plan? What are the components of the individual plan currently listed from ISBE? And how are these components living in our course sequences? It's, sometimes we will develop a plan and, and it kind of sits up on top of a shelf and it looks nice and shiny, but how are we really implementing these things uh, within our course sequences? And that's why we felt that was a, a real easy segue to this idea is that since we've talked about course sequence today, uh, really laid out some of the questions that have come up around the course sequence, that the natural progression of this conversation is what, what is next in the individual plan as a part of this work.
And so um, just like we recommended, going into the Career Pathways user group email, if you have something that you're doing great around career goals for each student, if you think you have um, a resource around the college plan or the financial aid plan or any of these other examples, and you want to share them with the group, again, just go ahead and put them in that Career Pathways user group email, um, send it to everyone, but we'll also be hopefully um, having some conversations around some of those resources and ideas um, when it comes up in, in our April meeting. So we, we just encourage you to share those if you have something that you're using that you feel is um, highlights some of the uh, great work that your school district is doing. We have our agenda, just kind of restating what we went through today. Um, we did want to uh, address some additional resources. So if, if you need additional resources, they can be found at the Pathway Endorsement website page. You'll notice, you'll notice here, and, and Heather called us out a, a, a few days ago, there's some new office hours. And so if you have questions, um, if, you, if you just need to get a hold of Heather and, and need her ear on a question, uh, March uh, 14th was yesterday, but March 20th, March 25th, April 4th, there's a whole host of dates laid out for the almost the remainder of the year. And so look at those dates. If you have a question that is coming up, make sure you're engaging her in those um, times that are slotted where she can answer questions as a part of this work. Um, you'll notice we have an evaluation. If, if a teammate of mine could go ahead and throw that evaluation into the chat. We hope that you enjoyed your time, that you maybe gained something from this presentation. Um, and then we'll kind of stick on here and, and kind of look at some of the questions that maybe came up. Heather, um, I know you're here for a little bit. And so if you saw a question that came up in the chat and you want to answer it, we can do that. But for really everyone else, um, we ask that um, you continue to uh, engage in this work, continue to come to these um, uh, scheduled meetings, but also engage in the career pathway email as well.